So welcome everyone. This is uh, the next session, The Politics of Disability Under Capitalism. My name is Jackie Chris, and I'll be chairing the session today. Um, so I would like to acknowledge the country. We're holding this conference on the land of the Wajak Nuna people. The land was never ceded, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. The Socialist Alliance stands in solidarity with Indigenous people in the ongoing fight for freedom from incarceration, land rights and genuine material sovereignty. Just um, information before we start that this session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the Green Left media site later on today. So we've got our three speakers, 20 minutes each. I'll try and give a 15 minute warning. Uh, we've got Graham Matthews from Darawal, Western Sydney. Graham is a disability rights activist, founding member of the Socialist Alliance and a regular contributor of Green Left. We have Brenton. Brenton is an anarchist and disability justice activist based in Boorooloo, Perth. And we have Riley Breen from Boorooloo, Perth branch and he's co-convener of Socialist Alliance Boorooloo branch. So um, we'll just get started and we'll start with Graham. Um, so the purpose of this talk is to provide something of a discussion starter for a uh, journey into uh, the political economy of um, disability and capitalism um, and to try and present a bit of a historical uh, perspective on that. So when considering the politics of disability and or under capitalism, it's always important to um, uh, begin with an understanding of the economic aspects of the relationship of people with disability and the means of production, um, and or indeed how we interact with society's producers and consumers, um, and how we are valued or indeed not. Thanks, Con. Paper is no longer my friend, I'm afraid. So, um, Con, will um, if we could. Next slide, please. So the first point to start, start is uh, what is disability? Um, and I suppose the, um, I take the position, and I think as um, political activists we take the position of the, uh, the social uh, model of disability that says that disability is caused by the way that society is organised uh, rather than a person's impairment or difference. Uh, and that when barriers are removed, disabled people uh, or people with disability can be independent uh, and equal in society uh, with choice and control over their own lives. Um, the first step is to define the problem. So what is disability? And I suppose um, the, 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 there is a medical model of disability, which is certainly the, uh, the dominant one, and certainly prominently the one which um, NDIS, for instance, um, is... is, is um, um, uh, users, which normalises the able-bodied, fit and healthy, white male, heterosexual adult uh, as the ideal person. Uh, and uh, this person uh, is the model for personhood, uh, or indeed citizenship, uh, in this society. And indeed, anybody who doesn't reflect uh, all of their characteristics is somehow lesser. So whether it be gender, or indeed um, uh, race, sexuality, etc., um, or indeed uh, ability, uh, then they are lesser. So people with disability um, are a case in point. By definition, we aren't as good as the ideal person, aren't necessary, uh, necessarily able to contribute to the economic wealth of capital uh, and have to be supported or assisted uh, in order to be able to participate in society, uh, generally at the cost of society or indeed, uh, in the worst case scenario, our families. There's also the social model disability, which um, uh, we mentioned, uh, which, uh, which is person-centred and places the responsibility for disability squarely at the feet of capital um, and the state, rather than placing the responsibility uh, on the individual, um, the individual person with disability, to find a way to overcome uh, their uh, disability individually. Next slide, next page, please. Thanks, Con. 
So before we get to um, uh, class society, I think it's important to um, have a look at pre-class society. And there is uh, this, uh, there was an absolutely fascinating um, uh, discovery which was um, populated the, uh, the popular media for a very short time, um, I think around about a year or two ago, um, which sort of shows how disability was treated at least in one important pre-class society, which is um, Aboriginal society. And um, this was the, uh, the case of the Mungo National Park uh, in Broken Hill. Their fo fossilised footprints from 20,000 years ago uh, were discovered uh, a, a few years ago. Uh, and they showed uh, this extremely important uh, fossil, uh, fossilised footprint of a, uh, a one-legged man. Um, who was, um, uh, they, they sort of surmised, uh, they, they understood it was a man based on the size of the foot and a number of other factors, which archaeologists will, but um, they surmised that this one-legged man probably used some kind of a stick in order to get around, but on this occasion he was obviously uh, running, uh, and I use that term advisedly, with the, um, the other members of his uh, family group, uh, probably chasing after some game or other. But it does sort of evidence that in pre-class society that people with disability were not necessarily isolated or indeed separated, but were included. And I think it's, from a Marxist point of view, it's extremely important that we have this understanding because one of the key elements of Marxism is, is this kind of idea of dialectical return, that we are um, trying to return to that kind of equality a pre-class society, but on a, on a much higher uh, level of um, the, the development of the, of the, the means of production. Uh, next slide and next. Um. So um, pre-capitalism, obviously, we had, we had feudalism. And uh, indeed, feudal society, certainly in Europe, uh, was organised in, in, in a quite a different way to, to, to capitalism. Independent, sorry, impediment has obviously existed historically. Uh, there's always been persons with impediment, whether it's physical or psychological disability, uh, throughout history. Um, but it was not otherwise, uh, it was otherwise integrated uh, into the social fabric. There's evidence that people with disability were integrated into feudal society and made a contribution as per their abilities. Uh, some were even able to, to excel. Um, Joan of Arc, for instance, who uh, everybody uh, has probably heard of, uh, is, uh, obviously uh, uh, played a role in uh, leading the French army, defeating the English uh, in the Hundred Years' War, was captured and um, uh, uh, burned by the, by the English, burned alive, and uh, was, was ultimately um, sanctified by the Catholic Church. Um, there's uh, evidence, or indeed there's uh, psychological historians um, argue that uh, it's very likely that she either suffered from schizophrenia or epilepsy or both. So you can see, you know, within in pre-class society or indeed in pre-capitalist society, it was possible for persons with disability to actually play an extremely leading role uh, in that society at different points. There was also the role of charity, um, generally provided by the church at the parish level uh, for those who, um, who needed it, and in that sense, um, that in direct involvement of um, also of persons with disability um, in the productive process to the, their abilities. To, in other words, that they were integrated at whatever level they were able to be involved. They certainly fundamentally not excluded or separated from the, uh, the productive process. Uh, next slide, next paper, please. It's always the way, isn't it? Another issue. <laughs> so, there's a wonderful um, phrase from um, Karl Marx's uh, volume one of Capital, uh, which is that um, capital comes dripping from head to toe, from every pore, with blood and dirt. Uh, and this is the, um, it expresses the violence uh, of capitalism and the way that capitalism was imposed uh, upon society. It didn't grow out of society in any kind of natural way. This was, this was a... a, a, a a, um, a, a productive um, uh, a means of production which was, um, uh, which was imposed on society. The productive class, the class that works and produces value, was, uh, as they say, liberated from the means of production. Uh, enclosures and other legislation separated the peasants from their means of subsistence. In many cases, both physically but also geographically, leading to mass migration from the countryside into the city. We've all heard this in school or at university. 
The new working class was forced to sell its labour power in order to afford the means of life. So no longer was subsistence in a certain sense guaranteed, at least in good times, by one's um, participation within society and, and membership of, a, of, a, of, a, of, of that society. Rather, now you had to find a way to sell your labour power to the capitalist class in order to survive. However, the factory system and later industrial capitalism required intense concentration, dexterity and repetitive movement. And not every person is able to do that, whether it be from physical or psychological um, disability. Um, and people with disability were largely excluded, uh, including those injured by the system itself. They joined the ranks of the unemployed, the reserve army of labour, and were generally impoverished um, and lived a very uncertain and uh, limited, limited subsistence. The rise of capitalism meant the breakdown of social bonds prominent within feudalism, privatisation of responsibility within the family, particularly women, who obviously took the greatest burden for looking after persons with disability, um, or at the extremes, institutionalisation. And um, I've included an image there from Bedlam, and we've all heard of Bedlam, which was obviously a, a, a one of the places where persons with psychological disability were placed, um, in, certainly in Victorian England. Uh, next slide and next paper, please. Now, as early as 1848, Marx and Engels acknowledged that the uh, class struggle compelled the working class to organise. Um, and organisation eventually wins social gains for working people. None are exactly permanent and all can be uh, are, are temporal and can be challenged and needed overthrown by capital at different points. But um, that organisation uh, did uh, have, uh, has had uh, gains for persons with disability over, over time, including limited pensions, initially for soldiers unable to continue fighting owing to physical disability, but later far more generalised. Uh, next slide, next paper, please. So I think the Australian situation is quite an interesting one in, in this context. Um, the um, part of the uh, Class Settlement of Federation in 1901 was a, um, uh, and the, 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 the constitution of um, uh, the Australian state was um, partly aimed at injured workers. And it sort of, I think, reflects the, um, the early phase of development of the welfare state, but also um, reflected the power of um, organised labour at that particular time. So Section 51 of the Australian Constitution, um, uh, the same section which allows for aged care pensions also allows for what are called the invalid pension. And albeit that um, it is not known as that uh, commonly, it's now the disability support pension, obviously, uh, that is still in the Constitution. So anybody who's on that, uh, you can <laughs> point to that and say that the Australian state believes that you are, in fact, an invalid. Um, but the um, early 20th century also began a period of war, revolution, uh, economic crisis and reaction. Uh, in Western Europe, this led to the rise of fascism, uh, the bourgeois extreme reaction to, to economic crisis. Um, and the apex of that reaction was the, uh, the Nazis in Germany. Uh, next slide and next piece of paper, please. So, and this is all a little bit depressing, but I think it's important. And I think, uh, albeit, and one might say, this is the absolute extreme of capitalism, this nevertheless was capitalism. And this was um, a the response of the Nazis to persons with disability um, and that description of useless eaters or indeed, um, you know, oxygen stealers or, or, or the, some of the other phrases which were used um, to um, uh, disparage uh, persons with disability. There was systematic discrimination against people with disability, exclusion and institutionalisation from practically the day that the Nazis uh, were voted or uh, attained power in 1933. Again, soon after their ascension, mercy killings, so-called mercy killings by doctors of children with disability uh, began. Um, twinned with this was the institutionalisation and segregation of people with disability. So um, in, um, you know, in, in, in hospitals and so forth, their confinement in, into, in, into institutions. However, this institutionalisation of persons with disability costs money. It was a burden to the state and it was something which the Nazis were keenly aware of. So in 1939, uh, shortly after the invasion of Poland, the systematic murder of persons with disability began. It was called um, Action T4, um, and it uh, developed the techniques of mass murder which would later be used in the death camps uh, with the, um, the Jewish people in the Holocaust and indeed others. Um, 
the, um, the development of the, the showers, for instance, we've all um, you know, seen documentaries and so forth of how these were used uh, with, with, with Jewish people and others in the concentration camps. These were initially used with um, people with disability who were rounded up, um, taken from these institutions in which they were placed and murdered, uh, systematically murdered by the Nazis. Um, now, fascism is an extreme example, but it is nonetheless a capitalist response to the crisis and indeed reducing the cost of people to disability to the state. The Action T4 formally ended in 1941, but the killings, particularly of children, continued uh, right through to the fall of the Nazis in 1945. Next slide, next piece of paper, please. So, on a more positive note, um, the, um, as we, after the war, and obviously um, we saw a, the rise of the civil rights movement, um, particularly in the States, but also in places like Australia, uh, with the, um, the, the Vietnam War and the, the social ferment uh, which, um, which arose at that time, and we're well aware of the, uh, the number of um, social movements which rose, whether it be the, um, the, 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 the movement for women's liberation or indeed um, uh, lesbian, gay, transgender, um, etc., um, bisexual um, uh, liberation, uh, or indeed black and indigenous, um, but also uh, disability rights. And around that same time, the disability movement um, was founded, uh, not only in Australia, but also internationally. The uh, 504 sit-in uh, in San Francisco, I, I read um, only, I'd only found out about it um, researching for this talk, uh, in April 1977 was considered the first uh, dis or disability action uh, protest um, in, in the States, obviously. A group of people with disabilities uh, staged a sit-in uh, in San Francisco, uh, demanding uh, greater accessibility and accommodation for people with disability. 1981, um, for those who can remember it, uh, was the um, International Year of Disabled Persons. And um, on the 10th of November 1981, 300 people with intellectual disabilities and their supporters rallied outside New South Wales Parliament demanding control over their housing and living conditions. The formal rights... Um, uh, so we, we, this led to, I suppose, um, the, the granting of formal rights and, in fact, the uh, 1992, the uh, National Anti-Discrimination, uh, Anti, sorry, Disability Discrimination Act, um, but at the same time, ongoing exclusion. More than 30 years after the formal acknowledgement of the rights of persons with disability through the Disability Discrimination Act, um, the gains won are limited and remain tenuous. Uh, next slide and next piece of paper, please. So this, um, this uh, graph comes from the Australian Bureau of Statistics and it displays, um, I suppose, the, uh, the, the number of people of working age, it's 15 to 64, um, or the percentage, rather, um, who are uh, working, both um, uh, persons with disability uh, or does not have a disability. So we see more than half um, of um, people who don't have a disability are in uh, full-time employment, um, but it's only um, it's just over a quarter of um, persons with disability. Um, and to return to our main theme of political economy and acknowledge that independence and self-determination in capitalist society is based on work. It's based on one's ability to be able to sell one's labour power to the capitalists and get uh, money in return to be able to, to buy nice things. The um, ability to perform a job and be paid. Um, so persons with disability significantly underrepresented in the workforce even more than 30 years after the passing of the Disability Discrimination Act in 1992. Just over 2 million persons with disability uh, of workforce age, around 1 million of those are not in the workforce at all. Not in the workforce at all, about half. Um, of those, 46.6% um, of working aged um, uh, people with disability, not in the workforce. Uh, where are they and how do they live? Uh, next slide and next piece of paper, please. So, um, everybody, I think, particularly anybody who has anything to do with, um, with disability or indeed um, the National Disability Insurance Scheme will be very familiar with this idea of cheaters um, or indeed um, the, the sustainability of the scheme. And there's nothing new about this kind of um, neoliberal um, ideological attack 
on um, the 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 the, the uh, funding which is provided from the state. Um, when I was a kid, for instance, it was all about doll bludgers and, and so on and so forth. And now, of course, it's it's persons with disability who are the new um, uh, 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 must be um, must be must be stopped. So the disability support pension is an important provision. Uh, for people with disability who are unable to work, or at least unable to work full time, to have a guaranteed income, albeit at the poverty level, um, and have some level of independence. Um, now that we have the right to work, uh, unfortunately, we also have the right to be excluded from income support. And around 16, sorry, uh, around 16.6 uh, million people are aged between 15 and 64 in Australia, which is generally described as being working age. Of those, 649,000 are on the DSP, uh, on the uh, Disability Support Pension. Um, so what of the other 350,000 people with disability who are neither working nor on the Disability Support Pension, how do they live? And to give some context, that's pretty much 350,000 people is the population of the Central Coast in New South Wales. It's the, it's the population of Wollongong or indeed Geelong. So this is an enormous number of people. How do they live? Uh, not working, not on the DSP. Um, well, obviously, it's in many cases, it's their families support them. And it's this privatisation of responsibility for what is a social, uh, a social creation. Disability is a social creation. So it's the state um, avoiding its responsibility to support people with disability. The neoliberal drive to reduce social subsidies and privatise the cost of supporting people with disability uh, into the family under the guise of independence. As I said, we're the new dull bludgers. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. And this is the last one. Uh, so um, then we go on to NDIS, and I think um, there are probably as many um, ideas about NDIS as there are participants, and I think there's over 400,000 now. But um, there, NDIS is, um, does represent the privatisation of services and um, a huge government subsidy to, uh, to private business. Um, you know, we talk about, um, and it's indeed the uh, mainstream media talk about the NDIS millionaires. Uh, it's how long until we actually come up with an NDIS billionaire. And certainly the way which the, uh, the government is trying to move things uh, with demanding that um, every uh, person who works in NDIS be registered and so forth, they are trying to facilitate this greater concentration uh, into sort of these extremely large corporations rather than individuals who provide support. Um, and indeed, uh, yeah, this massive concentration of capital. So there are massive limitations with the way that NDIS um, works and functions, but also elements of self-determination, particularly choice and control, which I believe, as a socialist, we should be defending. And we should also, I believe, defend the lack of means testing. Um, practically every other uh, uh, form of social assistance provided by the capitalist state is means tested. Even something as, as basic as aged care, um, you know, particularly aged care outside of um, uh, aged institutions, you know, my, my aged care, so-called. Um, again, it's, um, it's, it's totally um, uh, means tested, both on um, income and also assets. And so uh, many can be denied funding based on their, um, their social situation. We need to defend the democratic aspects, the social inclusion, the independent aspiration. The fact that um, NDIS funding is supposed to be based on one's goals, one's aspirations in life, to allow us, persons with disability, to aspire to have independence is an extremely positive thing, and it's something which needs to be, it needs to be um, defended. We need to oppose the robo-planning, and indeed um, this may be one of the key aspects of the, 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 the so-called reforms that um, Uncle Bill Shorten is trying to bring in at the moment. Um, we need to oppose that to stop them uh, limiting uh, the, the, the opportunities of NDIS and limiting the funding provided for individuals and indeed to oppose the cuts. Well, that um, pretty much concludes my um, um, presentation. So um, thank you and um, hopefully we can have a good discussion. Thanks, Graham. That was great and right on time. A really great uh, socialist, disciplined socialist, great example. Thanks. So we've got Sometimes. Brent. <laughs> All right, a little bit over time. Um, 
we've got Brenton next. Thanks. Can I take this out of the stand? Thank you. All right, so I'm Brenton. Um, I'm autistic. I have ADHD, by which I mean that I am like woefully unprepared for this uh, <laughs> session. Um, so yeah, I've just been out at a shopping centre doing a disruption for Palestine. Um, just rushed here and now up on stage to talk. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so I was kind of a bit like, as usual with most things I am, like kind of like, what do I just talk about? What do I talk about? What do I talk about? Maybe I should talk about this. Maybe I should talk about that. Maybe I should talk about this other thing. Um, very difficult to make a decision. Uh, but yeah, I think I think what's something that um, I've been really sort of advocating for, as you can see from probably the, the zines that have been passed around, uh, is accessibility for disabled people. Um, so I... I am a member of an organisation called Crips Contra Colonialism, and we've been planning like uh, like online vigils for disabled people to engage um, where they might otherwise be left out. So, for example, the FOPA rallies in the city, there was a tough period of time where they made the decision that we're going to bang pots and pans. Um, and I think that like just being at a protest in the first place is exhausting and overwhelming. Um, for people like me and for many other people, I'm sure. And that kind of felt like a bit of a slap in the face. It's like you're actively making a decision to make this thing less accessible for everyone. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, so we kind of started doing the online vigils to sort of address that and to give people the sort of a way to engage and to um, participate in the kind of pro-Palestine movement um, where they could do it. In, on their own terms, from the safety of their homes, uh, COVID safe, obviously, you're not around people, you can take breaks whenever you want. Um, so yeah, accessibility is very important, um, something we kind of try to prioritise in our organising. Um, so to address the elephant in the room, this session is not being live streamed, um, which was kind of disappointing to hear. Uh, I think of all the sessions to be live streamed, this is probably a pretty crucial one, right? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think it's not, not gonna do much use to be like, no, fuck you, why didn't you make this accessible? Um, I, think, I think it's worth having this conversation right now because it's like, if a disability session is not accessible, then that's kind of very, Hypocritical. Well, it's hypocr I, feel hypocr I feel a bit like a hypocrite standing up here and being like, yeah, and participating in this without calling it out um, because I do talk, I do try to sort of promote accessibility as much as possible. Um, so, yeah, I think it's something that, oft again, it often goes overlooked and it is a crucial thing. It's not something that is just for people with disability, is it? It's, it benefits everyone, um, whether that's someone who lives out whoop whoop in a rural area who can't necessarily come out to a protest because it's three hours away from the city or whether it's a parent who has to stay home and look after their kids. Like accessibility is a benefit to everyone and yet it kind of gets relegated to like, oh, that's just disabled, that's just for disabled people. Um, so yeah, I just think I wanted to sort of have that, start to have that conversation. Um, so I think even like in this room looking around, there's, how many of you wearing masks? Two, three. So again, for people who are immune compromised, this is kind of an inaccessible situation. Um, I mean, I don't particularly like wearing masks. They piss me off, uh, but I try to wear them where I can. Um, so yeah, I think it's just really like, it's something that doesn't really, people don't really even think about to begin with, right? It's like, oh, it just doesn't cross their mind in the first place. Um, and it's something that like, it's like you cannot build, we're here because we want to build this better society that is more inclusive and that is more, uh, that is friendlier and kinder to everyone and that works better for everyone. 
But, like, you can't do that as long as you're excluding people. You can't, like, perpetuate these systems of oppression and perpetuate those systems of marginalisation and hope to build a society that is free of marginalisation. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think... Um, oh, total brain blank. <laughs> So yeah, I think what I kind of wanted to do was maybe actually talk to you guys. What are your experiences of being excluded for accessibility issues? Um, you know, I'm sure we've all had situations where, you know, you've been sick and you've had to miss a meeting. Or, you know, you have been, you've been working rurally and you've had to miss a protest. Um, so, yeah, does anyone want to, like, volunteer and give their personal experience of being kind of... Yeah, mate? Do you want to come up and talk on the mic? Hello, my name's Neil. I'm from Perth. Anybody wants to know? The MG mob and everything like that. I've been disabled for quite some time now. I had a very serious workplace accident in Armadale, New South Wales. I injured my back very badly and my neck as well. I'm doing truck work and stuff like that. And then when I, when I was heading over this way with the wife, Coming out of this side of the country, I happened to see the front end of a road train just when we just made across the, the South Australian border. We were sort of out uh, Broken Hill Way and everything like that. I saw the front end of a road train, he spun us, and I had my oldest boy, son, with me at the time, and my wife was travelling behind with two other sons, four wheel drive trailer on, and everything like that. So he spun us, I seen the front end of the trailer, and I saw, I, I, was locked, I was pinned in the vehicle with the steering rod, which was a really big, thick steering rod, that had sort of been straight up through the bottom of my Pantac vehicle, because I was in a three-ton truck at the time, which was a small Pantac, and I just sort of had this great big steering rod hitting me smack in, in the face, that's sort of like about all I remember. I remember sort of, uh, I remember coughing out a whole heap of teeth and everything like that. And then I was in the hospital for quite some time. I couldn't walk or anything like that after the accident. It took me a very long time to get back to walking and everything like that. But I'm finding now that because I sort of look normal, you know what I mean, a lot of people don't, sort of know that I have disability and stuff like that. And I cop a fair bit of flack because I look normal and I, and I get around pretty good because I really push myself to the limit. Because back in the early days here, I was a long distance runner and I was a very good long distance runner. And when I mean I said I was very good, I was. I was the best in the state. I was winning all these awards and everything like that. And they'd take me down south to Bunbury and everything like that. And I was running up against the 18 year olds and I'm 15, you know, I'm beating them. So I'm pushing it to the limit. And it was because I had that knowledge of how to push everything to the limit. We get to a place like we get maximum amount of pain. I've been in maximum amount of pain for quite some time now. I deal with pain each and every day, but I've learned in the place in my brain how to block it all out and how to get over all of that, how, how to work and how to work and do all of that with my disability. Yeah. So how do you think that that pain has kind of made it difficult for you to engage in kind of social movements? Have you been... Mate, look. After, after I got hit by the road train, it was like I was three years of age again. I lost all my social skills and everything like that. I couldn't go anywhere because I just wanted to, any, any, any sort of vehicle travel like that, any time I'd see a, see a truck post me out of stress, yeah, don't worry about that one. I, I, I was hit really badly with it, and every time because I was, I, 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 was, I was peeing a lot, 
I was having to pull up all the time and asking the wife to stop for me. And I was having problems getting up to Fremantle Hospital and stuff like that, trying to get across bridges and stuff like that when they got road trains and everything in front of you. I did it with hell. Yeah. But I here I am today. Yeah. Thank you for coming along. Good job. Yep. That's great, mate. Thanks. So we'll just hand it over to Brenton. Did you want to finish off? How much time I got left? You got about five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think he raises an interesting point about invisible disabilities and the way that, again, like if you are not visibly disabled, you often get kind of shafted because people make this assumption that because you look capable and maybe you seem on the surface capable um, and can actually, you know, go out and do things and appear to be functioning normally, oftentimes that's not the reality behind closed doors. Um, you know, I'm, I'm personally one of those people that Graham was talking about before who aren't employed. Um, I mean, I'm out here organising, I'm out here doing stuff. As I said, I was out at this direct action, but then when I get home, it's like crash and my entire life is a train wreck. Um, and I think it's, there's often this kind of thing of like, um, where it's like we have to, we're put const consistently put in a position as disabled people where we have to, have to be the ones to advocate for ourselves when we have little to no energy to actually do so. Um, and again, it's this thing that doesn't even really get thought about is how do we include disabled people? How do we actually facilitate their engagement? Um, within our movements and I mean everyone is going to be disabled at some point you can't avoid it you're going to or even if you can you're going to have a child that has a disability you're going to have a family member that is disabled um, so I think it ultimately is it is an issue of sustainability to any social movement is actually addressing dis addressing accessibility and making things accessible to people because you could, this, if we want to actually, again, build this bigger society, it's going to take everyone and it needs to be, and it's going to take a consistent sort of commitment and engagement uh, from everyone. And if you're, you get sick and you have to drop out entirely because you just can't, there's no options for you to even begin to engage, um, that is, like, that's not sustainable. It's not sustainable for anyone um, because, yeah, there's just no momentum moving forward. You're losing momentum constantly because um, people are not being included. Um, yeah, so I think, again, just prioritising accessibility is very important. Um, in, and actually asking those questions of disabled people, how do we prioritise accessibility? How can we um, make this space more inclusive to you and other people? Um, yeah, and just making that effort, I think, to be an ally and to actually support it. Um, yeah, ultimately it is kind of, it's a form of mutual aid, making things more accessible. Um, actually, yeah, making that effort to reach out to people and be like, hey, what do you need? How can I help? How can we, as organisers, plan things to facilitate your engagement? Um, because I think, again, if you want to build a society that is free of these systems of oppression, you need to actually not rely on those systems of oppression. You need to not reproduce them. Uh, in your actions. So yeah, I think that's me done. Right. Thanks for that. Um, and thanks for highlighting our own deficits in our own organisations. We'll take that on board. Um, and now Riley, thanks. You can come up here or you can... Uh, hi everyone. Um, so the... My background is I've, I've spent my, most of my life collecting diagnoses, um, almost like little collectibles you put on a shelf, um, variously, you know, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, autism disorder, whatever else, uh, to, to the point where it becomes a bit absurd. You, you know, you, you end up saying you, you don't actually have all, you know, this and this and this and this and this. It's actually something weird's going on. We don't have a good word for it. <laughs> Um, and it, it does expose just kind of how how bizarre the way we we label and uh, diagnose things actually is. Um, sorry, hang on, my phone is not displaying correctly. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about something a lot more abstract than um, than Brenton and Graham have. Um, 
So, um, I don't, I'm going to talk about how um, mental illness in particular is um, – how capitalism in, uh, creates and is a large contributor to the development of mental illness. Um, so, in, um, in 2009, uh, Mark Fisher wrote in Capitalist Realism um, – even if it is true, for instance, that depression is constituted by low serotonin levels, what we need, what still needs to be explained is why particular individuals have low levels of serotonin. Um, and he was talking about uh, societal causes of uh, depression and uh, other uh, mental illnesses as well. I only think he was half right. Uh, I'm going to be a bit pedantic and correct him. Um, if because the the idea that serotonin doesn't is the cause of depression has been debunked for a long time. Um, you know, if I give any one of you uh, an SSRI, uh, your, within a day your levels of serotonin are going to go up, but actually your side effects are going to get worse. You're not going to feel better for a couple of weeks. So that kind of proves that that's not actually true. Um, but that's uh, kind of a pedantic point. <laughs> um, so w what, what we actually kind of know now in terms of scientific background um, about... Uh, mental illness, most mental illnesses as they're defined anyway, um, is that there is a large genetic component to them, but also a large stress component to them. Stress is actually, you know, you can see lots and lots of articles about stress, uh, you know, stress-induced, stress-mediation of, of all these things. Um, sorry, my hands are shaking so much that it's hard for me to read my notes. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, so what um, what we actually know now is that it's actually a combination of so it's it's not just one thing or another it's actually these things how they combine. Um, so I was I was telling my psychiatrist <laughs> that I was going to be doing this you know I'm really anxious I'm going to have to do this talk really stressed out about this. He's like oh great I've got some lecture slides I can send you. <laughs> So um, I'm actually going to pull this up. It's a little bit of a scientific background. It's, you know, from a doctor. So, um, uh, yeah, if you just... It's already open. So this is a bit of a, a clinical defi definition, <laughs> just to give you some background. I'll, I'll explain why I'm going into this. It's not just a, a random detour. Um, but um, if we... So stress is actually not very well defined um, and it's basically you have to ask them, do you feel stressed? And they say, yes, well, you're stressed. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the definition. Um, and here's a, a lot of very boring scientific detail that I think is still important to keep in mind because it shows that it isn't actually just an emotion. It is that as well, but it is, it's a thing that is physically experienced. Uh, and it's, it's physically present in, in your body. You can actually measure it in, in certain ways. Well, you can't measure it, but you can measure things that it causes. Um, and these are the various ways that it... Um, so this, the main point to take away here, actually, is that there, there's a big difference between acute stress, which is um, something's coming at you, a lion's attacking you, you've got to defend yourself, and chronic stress, which is I am living in absolute poverty day in and day out, I have no resources, I have to do something about this. So acute stress is actually quite useful. I mean, it's, a, it's an adaptation. So we, you know, lines coming at you, shit, I've got to do something about this. Your heart rate goes up. Your, um, in fact, I've got all the list of stuff, courtesy of Dr. Allett. <laughs> um, so it changes your blood sugar, it changes your blood pressure, pulse, breathing, temperature, sweating, bowel function, apparently. <laughs> Um, but uh, one particular thing that, that I've kind of learned a lot about is uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is um, it's the same thing that happens when you get sick, uh, and it is disastrous to your body. In it, It's useful because it stops you from... It prevents an infection in the short term, but if you're getting them lots and lots and lots, it causes long-term problems. And this is what it causes in the long term. Um, so... 
increase in inflammation and <laughs> it's actually a popular science thing at the moment. If you look in the conversation, uh, this stress causes this, stress causes that, stress causes tumours, stress causes... And they'll talk about inflammation and diets and which diet you can buy to decrease your inflammation. <laughs> um, but it, it shows that there is a, a really uh, long... Uh, a really physical, tangible, scientific... Uh, element to that emotion uh, and that that's all I have on that um, so the, the reason I'm talking about stress is because I just wanted to hone in on a particular element of how capitalism uh, can create real problems in our lives and not just the 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 very immediate problems that we see but how <laughs> how those problems then cause further problems because if you happen to ha like me, have the genetics that predispose you to uh, the more negative effects of stress. If you have the genetics that predispose you to bipolar disorder, for instance, then that can be pretty fucking ruinous. Um, so, the, the, um, so while genetics is, yes, a, a component, um, it's a component we can't really do much about unless, you know, that's a very dark path. I don't think I need to explain to any of you why eugenics is bad. Um, but the, the, the way this has been explained to me is, um, you know, you, if you take someone that's 20 years old and really fit and really healthy, push them over, they're probably going to be fine. If you take a 70-year-old person with osteoporosis and push them over, they're probably not going to be so fine. Um, and so, um, and there's not much we can really do about the osteoporosis, but we, what we can do is prevent people from being pushed over. And so that's... Um, that's kind of where I'm, I'm going with this stress thing. Um, so I, I'm trying to kind of link the, the this almost kind of bioessentialist view um, and this medical model, as, as Graham put it earlier, to and, and create a bit of a the, uh, synthesis and look at how we can view that as Marxists. Because I think as Marxists, we need to still think about the material world as materialists, right? So this actually gives us a way of saying it's not just all in the mind, it's not just the world of ideas, but actually all these things are real, they're physical. Yeah. Um, let me just find my notes. So with this, um, now if we understand that stress creates these real problems, we can actually go, you know, not just in the abstract sense, but I mean, you can look at all the ways that capitalism just stresses us all the fuck out, like housing insecurity. You know, if you don't know where you're going to live from one day to the next, or if you are stuck with an abusive person because you can't afford to move out, that's fucking stressful. If you, your wages have stagnated and you can no longer afford to buy food or you have to choose between buying food or paying rent or... Um, buying food for yourself or buying food for your child. That's stressful. Yeah. Uh, and if you have no money and you even just can't afford to buy nice things that make life a little bit meaningful, that's you know, it's the one thing that you can do to take away the stress of your life. Um, and then you can even go further and look at the, the alienation we all have from labour. Um, you know, we work meaningless jobs for, to, to enrich other people and that just further compounds that. Um, and none of these things can be understood in individual terms. So even though we treat mental illness, eh, to the extent we have to treat mental illness on an individual basis, we can prevent them on a societal basis. Um, and um, that's pretty much uh, all I have to say on that. Um, so, the you know the, the treatment of mental is, is individual, but um, pr yeah, that's sorry I've lost my train of thought. Um, that's all I have to say on that. Thanks for that. I'll just put it down. I'll go here. All right, everyone. So, thank you. I know where I feel my stress. It's in the gut. Anyway, um, so we're going to open up a discussion. Yes, Nova? <laughs> All right, right. I've just got a couple more things to say. Settle down. Um, 
So, yes, I just wanted to reiterate, this session is going to be, is recorded. And if people do not want to be public and make comments, just, um, they want to make comments, but they don't want them to be public, please let us know beforehand. So we'll take a round of three. So if you can keep your comments and questions to say three minutes, um, and we'll take it. Nova, and then anyone else? We'll start with Nova. You, what's your name? Izzy. Izzy, Nova and Izzy first, and if, we'll start with Nova. There you go. Yep. Hello, thank you. That was a brilliant, brilliant speech all around. Um, one, one thing that I reflect on, I, 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 I've read David, uh, Michael Oliver's book, the, the Politics of Disablement, many years ago, and um, it really um, changed how I thought about a lot of things in terms of, of disability. And um, then it was later when I was um, arguing almost knives out with Brenton about whether whether the, the social model of disability holds any weight that I really noticed just how dialectical the model is. Where, where the disabled person is understood both in terms of their relation to society, uh, the social side of it, and in terms of their, their, uh, their impairment. Um, and um, the thing about dialectics, when you have these, these things um, where, where a, a dual definition, um, where on one hand it can be understood in this way and on, one, on the other hand it can be understood in the other way, is governments take that and they say, in what way benefits us the most? So when you have things like the NDIS, inclusion in the workplace, that's completely social. We can basically get everyone in the, in the disabled community into the workplace and, and then they, they cry about the, the, stubborn, uh, the stubborn rate of, of autistic unemployment. Um, and, and then on the other hand, when it comes to the distribution of actual social, social services, supports, um, it's entirely medical because the, the medical model exists to gatekeep those, those social supports. Um, I guess this is sort of my reflections on, on dis disability, but um, I'd, I'd love to know what, what the three of you think about that. And also thank you, Brenton, for sort of bringing that to my attention. Oh, we'll take Izzy next. And we'll, then we'll get the panel to respond. Um, just wanted to say first thank you um, to all the speakers. Um, it was very fascinating, especially to hear everybody's different um, personal experiences. And um, I think what's also important to talk about is to be able to find gainful employment or social acceptance um, as a neurodivergent person. A lot of the time it requires masking and that can contribute to physical somatic symptoms of stress and anxiety. And as an AFAB person especially, you're required to mask in society often, um, otherwise you face consequences of um, discrimination and prejudice. And so it would just be really interesting to hear, um, you know, possibly your, your experiences of masking and of whether or not you believe that it's necessary um, or, you know, if it's um, exclusionary in a lot of different ways um, and just your personal experience. What was the adjective you used? Sorry? Uh, masking. No, 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 sorry, that's a something person. AFAB. Well, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, AFAB is assigned female at birth, so uh, women and femme presenting people. So if we open it up to the panel, who wants to start? I'll just, I'll just say Graham can go first. No. Oh, Brenton. Cool. Oh, uh, yeah, I was just kind of racking my brain to remember that conversation I apparently had with Nova. Um... <laughs> I think the gist of it was that my kind of understanding of social, dis go it goes beyond the social model because I think, and I think the social model does specify a difference between disability and impairment from memory. Um, but I guess what, we were, what I was kind of talking about is the very practical realities of being disabled. Um, yeah, the material reality of being disabled is that I am not good with people 
and therefore I'm not going to, no matter how society changes, there is not really a way in which I'm suddenly going to become amazing with people. Um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of what the nature of the discussion was from memory. Um, and I mean, I think that kind of links in in some ways to like the idea of masking. Um, I think that, again, it's something that's instilled in you from a very early age is that you have to be a certain way, you have to act a certain way, um, and you sort of start to internalise that and then you perform um, as normal. You try to perform as normal um, so that other people will accept you and so that you can fit into these systems of these capitalist systems um, and integrate. Um, so, yeah, I think um, it's obviously something that I think is ultimately quite harmful. But, again, there is a practical element of, like, this is kind of... Well, I guess as it relates to organising, it's like you kind of have to... There are models of organising where you have to sort of play the game to organise. Like, um, if you want to organise a protest, like, there's just th things that have to be done materially. You have to get speakers. You have to do... You have to have... Um, you have to book things in, you have to get a sound system. And, like, that's all very exhausting as someone who is neurodivergent, like, trying to manage all that stuff, and it's overwhelming. But, again, that's the practical reality of kind of what needs to happen to have a protest, right? And so there's this sort of thing where, for me at least, I find that I often rely on, like, that masking or, I don't know, a kind of structural dissociation where I'm sort of autopiloting to actually be productive and to get shit done. Um, which and it's, creates this weird and uncomfortable sort of um, thing where it's like, yes, this thing is useful to me, but it's also harmful to me. And it's this push and pull of like, how do I negotiate um, being able to participate in the movement and trying to make things better whilst when that thing is kind of like harmful to me in many ways. Um, yeah. I really appreciate the um, both um, questions or indeed um, discussion starters. I think it's really important. And there, there's a lot to um, to unpack there and certainly um, I suppose um, my journey, for a better word, uh, in, in disability is relatively um, shorter than, than, than many perhaps in the sense that um, it was something which I acquired uh, after turning 50. So, um, you know, in a certain sense I was had, you know, 50 years as, as that sort of white male, uh, you know, uh, full-time worker, et cetera, et cetera. And it's it sort of, um, it, it's a question of, um, what do they call it? Um, adjustment. Adjustment is the particular euphemism that um, the, the medical system uses in these situations, you know. So it's, um, but I think if we, uh, trying to reflect on what I hoped I tried to present in terms of um, political economy, I think trying to take a long view of history and understanding that, um, I mean, if we accept that um, people have always had impediments, um, and indeed I think the, uh, the, the, that example of the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the indigenous man, the one-legged one indigenous man 20,000 years ago and his inclusion uh, in that social group, um, which is quite evident from that, those fossilised remains, shows that um, you know, there has always been impediment, but society has not always excluded those with impediment. And I think this society is exclusionary, right? This, whether it be, I mean, and, and it's obviously there's um, the Disability Discrimination Act and there's, you know, EEO principles and blah, 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 blah. But sim the simple fact that um, the majority of people who live with a disability live in some level of poverty or indeed of uncertainty of being able to maintain uh, their, um, their, their um, uh, connection with um, the economy and, and, and life in, in some form or another, I think is um, make things incredibly difficult, make things incredibly difficult. Um, if there's one um, glimmer of good that came out of the pandemic, in my, in my opinion, it's the, uh, the fact that so many of us now can work from, can work from home, uh, which perhaps, um, you know, I, I don't know, uh, but it's certainly, um, you know, and I don't um, claim to be neurodiverse as such, but certainly, um, uh, you know, I have PTSD and certainly being able to, um, to work from home um, helps. And I think this sort of, um, this, this uh, perhaps um, 
uh, strays into the uh, to the other question about masking. And obviously, look, when when one has um, uh, large parts of one's body um, amputated, it's quite difficult to mask that, I suppose. Um, it is look, it is possible. You know, there's certainly um, one can get prosthetics with. Um, what they call cosmeses and so forth, and and certainly quite a number of people with, um, you know, for instance, um, um, uh, single uh, below knee amputations choose that way, you know, and, um, and and live, you know, in the community without necessarily identifying themselves as being uh, living with a disability or indeed being an amputee. Um, in my situation, uh, I prefer to be, in a certain sense, out and proud, um, I suppose. It's also uh, the easiest and most comfortable way uh, to live. Uh, so even um, at work, for instance, um, I get around even in the middle of winter uh, with shorts. So, um, and uh, it's quite evident. Um, and, I, and I find that's probably the safest way, frankly, to get around. Um, you know, the, the work site is not accessible. Uh, albeit I work in a building, for instance, which was um, built, only opened in 2016. Um, it has incredibly um, heavy glass doors, uh, which provide a sort of a, a, a soundproofing, you know, to uh, major social areas like the lunchroom and so forth. <laughs> they were completely impossible for me to access, um, particularly um, if, I'm try if I'm carrying a hot cup of tea and I more or less had to back into these things like a, a front-end loader and, and push them open <laughs> and hope that I didn't get bumped. Um, Ultimately, um, you know, there are, you know, government uh, subsidies and so forth and certain changes were made. But it, it, does, it does reflect on that. And I think, um, you know, we all um, have to uh, deal with that and deal with the fact that we, um, uh, I suppose, as persons living with disability, that we, we don't match up to that um, idealised uh, citizen in that sense because in some form or another we... Um, uh, we, we you know, we don't meet that um, uh, that, that that ideal. So it's um, uh, we're always looking to um, to account for that, make up for that. Um, and I think um, there can be, uh, certainly in, in my circumstance, my, my personal experience, there can be a lot of shame attached to that. And I think it can be very difficult. It is extremely important, I think, and and those. Uh, those who are here today who identify as being disabled in some form or another, living with a disability, I think it's, um, it's, it's fantastic. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And, and perhaps just partly, and I do, I do really understand, um, you know, Brenton's comment about um, it's a shame that we couldn't have this, um, uh, this, this particular um, workshop uh, live streamed, and I'm sure that we would have if we could have had with the resources. I've no doubt we, we, we would. Uh, but it will be um, published on... Um, my understanding on um, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, on a uh, green left um, uh, media, to, it'll media. Be on this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. So, so at least um, others will be able to view it as such. Um, but the fact that we're having a workshop on this issue, I mean, again, I've been in the socialist movement now for well over thirty years, and uh, I can't remember a previous one which I've spoken at uh, about this issue. You know, apart from policy in the socialist alliance, mm -hmm. and I think socialist alliance has excellent policy uh, on the, the rights of persons with disability. But um, in, in terms of this public forum. Forum where we can discuss and engage this issue, I think this is fucking fantastic. <laughs> and um, I, uh, and again, my um, my kudos goes out to all of you uh, who who are here with disability. It ain't easy, uh, and I think it's extremely important that we we take this step. Um, anyone else? I've got Zeta. We've got Janet and oh, Isaac. Isaac. Sorry, uh, that guy with the I, am, I am getting old. Uh, um. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to talk about more on the um, uh, the commodification, basically, of um, disability and disability services. In, in relation to how the NDIS has panned out and the absolute debacle that's been made of it, really. Um, I suppose it it's goes along the same way as the way health and um, the way we deal with health has also been commodified. Mm. I get so cross when I, um, I hear people who I treat, because I'm a nurse, I just work in a general hospital, um, but when we start to talk about people as consumers that 
truly pisses me off no end. Um, so, and it's so, and it's become so much, it seems so much worse in the disabil disability sphere because now um, people who have a disability or people who care for people with disabilities now have to negotiate finding people um, with the funds supposedly that they've been given within a certain, uh, and so it's all about money. It's all about, you know, it's not about the care and responsibility as a society that we need to be having for people who are unwell or have a disability or are neurodivergent. It's, it's so twisted in that, that capitalist society and I just want to know what your comments would be on that. So we've got Janet, and then we've got Isaac, and then we'll have um, finish off with some the panel's closes because the next session starts at five o'clock. Um, my question really was about um, what prospects do you think there is for building a, a, a disability rights movement to reject? Um, some of the direction that, I mean, already there's so much to protest in relation to the, the way that NDIS has evolved, as Zeta has said. Um, and, and I know that there's a huge critique out there in the disability sector, um, and, and it's, it's voiced in sort of online, you know, discussions and so on. But, you know, I sort of feel like we need the renewal of a movement such as we saw in the 60s when, when the disability rights movement first became a thing. Um, post World War II, and um, I just wonder, you know, is in the context of whatever changes are being proposed, which I imagine, and uh, in the in the role that I currently work in, I can see uh, every day I see people experiencing cuts, sometimes to the tune of fifty percent to their NDIS programs in the in the sort of efforts for savings and so on. So I just wonder, how do we, how, you know, is are there is there an opportunity to mobilise people and their broad and more broadly the community? Um, in relation to some of those proposals. Thanks. Isaac. Thanks, Jackie, and thanks, everyone. Um, I just want to say, first of all, as someone, the person who will probably be editing the session, it won't be up this afternoon, but it will be up in the next <laughs> couple of days. Um, and I just wanted to ask, I really liked what you're talking about of the vigils, uh, online vigils for people to join in the Palestinian movement who can't attend a protest or other actions. Um, so I just wanted to hear about, I guess, any other examples of, of, of strategies that have uh, been used to make it more accessible for people to join in protest movements or participate in solidarity in various ways. What strategies have been successful and what can we kind of look towards as uh, other, other ideas of, of doing that? Um, that's all. Thanks. So we'll have um, the last comments from the panel and then we'll close up. Um, Riley? You sure? Go on. Go on. There you go. Cool. Um, oh, just let me try and mentally work back through the questions, what they were. I've already forgotten the first two. Uh, oh, yes, NDIS, and I guess the way it sort of dehumanises people. Um, I was... So I'm a cancer survivor, and I think it, there's a sort of... My experience of... Uh, being treated in hospital was that I was very much kind of an object to be acted upon. Um, like when you're sick, it's not like when you're sick like that, it's kind of like you don't in yourself, like you don't feel like you have options. It's like you have take the treatment or you die. Um, and I've sort of, and being neurodivergent, I think that like in some ways I felt like there was a lack of consent in the way that I was treated because I can't really process what's happening around me and this stuff is, and it's kind of like, yes, this has to happen or you're going to die. You don't really have a choice. And so it, I found that it was, yeah, it was like being an object in some ways. Um, and I think that kind of is extrapolated out to the way that these things are dealt with um, economically is that uh, your body is kind of objectified and your personage is objectified. Um, and that's kind of just like, well, this is the way it is um you know if you want to get better from cancer you have to endure the chemo you have to be stabbed with needles repeatedly um that's just the way it is and it's kind of hard to be like to actually take agency i think in those kinds of situations um did you have something you wanted to speak to on that yeah, you, you go okay 
Um, well, I was just going to continue to the second question, the second comment, which was. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think the original thing I was going to talk about was kind of like intersectionality um, and the way that these different movements kind of intersect. I mean, like working class people are they're out there busting their asses in backbreaking jobs. Like that debilitates your body, doesn't it? Um, so working class people are more likely to end up with disabilities because they can't. They're, they're out there doing the hard labour. Um, they don't have necessarily the resources to afford proper health care. Um, they don't have access to, I guess, the bureaucratic literacy to go and get on something like the NDIS a lot of the time. Um, so there's an intersectionality there. And the same can be said for, you know, people of colour, for queer people. Um, so it's recognising that, like, these marginalised groups do intersect um, and that they're not, like, atomised issues. It does kind of extend across, it is like a web of interconnected sort of um, vectors of oppression. Um, yeah. Uh, and then the last one was how to make things more accessible. Um, yeah, well, I think, uh, as I said, like the online aspect, having that way to engage where people can kind of do it in their own time. Um, uh, now it's really dry. Sure. Um, as I was um, preparing for this um, uh, workshop, I um, tried to um, do a certain amount of reading uh, to, um, uh, because obviously nothing's new in this world and certainly um, the, uh, the, the treatment of people with disability by capitalism is an issue which um, quite a number of scholars, uh, disabled Marxist scholars in particular, have um, uh, raised over the years. And one name uh, kept um, coming up, uh, which was uh, Marta Russell, which I'm sure Nova knows, uh, no, uh, was a, a, an American... Um, Oh, yeah, I do, do, do. She's very good. Yeah, very good. Um, she was, um, and I say was because I've, she apparently um, died suddenly back in the teens, the 20 teens. Um, I, I don't know what her disability was uh, exactly, um, but um, she wrote a book. Um, her seminal book was um, Beyond Ramps, Disability and the End of the Social Contract. And um, she, she provided that kind of a historical analysis of... Um, the treatment of people with disability. And it, it, it speaks to uh, the question around uh, the, the commodification of uh, the bodies, I suppose, of people with disability. And um, in her context, she was talking about the American context, obviously, uh, and they don't have an NDIS equivalent, but um, the, the analysis that she used was um, uh, people with disability and uh, nursing homes, and particularly you know, young people, younger people, and the, the fact that um, they will be shuffled into nursing homes, and certainly, uh, you know, uh, we have a very um, uh, great comrade and friend, um, Terry Townsend, who, who many here would know, uh, who um, uh, suffered a brain bleed, uh, I think, in 2015. And um, as part of the uh, recovery from that was, was shuffled, uh, albeit that I think he was only in his 50s at the time, was shuffled into a nursing home for quite a number of months before he was allowed by NDIS to return home uh, until the, uh, when, the, when the house was actually um, uh, fully um, uh, modified. Um, but in the American context, um, the, the, the fact was that the, this, I suppose the nursing home industry, and it is very much a privatised industry there, worked out that um, the disabled body was something they could make money out of. So um, uh, rather than um, you know, paying for people a, a stipend to allow people to um, employ support workers, does that sound vaguely familiar? Uh, the, he, um, <laughs> They uh, 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 shuffle people into um, uh, into um, uh, the the uh, nursing home situation, which obviously costs a lot more, but it makes a lot more money for the uh, nursing home providers, um, and, and that's why that's why that was done. And her argument, of course, is that we need to regain control over our own lives, and the only way we can do that is by having funds that we can direct, which is, I think, the element of NDIS that is well worthwhile. Um, supporting and fighting for, continuing to fight for. Now, how we fight for this and how we win, that it really is, if we could work that out in this room, I think, um, you know, then next stop's the revolution. But, um, 
but ultimately it is it is a question that we all need to put our minds to and I think we all need to to find a positive solution to um, you know for anybody who's read um, whether it's the green left articles or it's the articles in the um, the Saturday paper or indeed um, any other um, you know thoughtful commentary about the uh, this um, uh, NDIS reform which has been put forward by the government it is so full of holes and so um, porous at the moment uh, nobody knows exactly uh, what the final form of this so-called reform is going to be uh, and, and indeed the um, the Senate has been asked to vote on something where basically the final form of it is being uh, deferred to, 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 to be worked out by the minister later down the track um, so we don't know exactly um, how much they're going to cut uh, in what ways they're going to cut, um, how uh, we, we, we know broadly and generally, but we don't know exactly um, how they're going to determine that. Bill Shorten talks about, oh, yeah, we're going to employ all these assessors. God knows, thousands of assessors, people who will come to the, to the house of the person with disability and spend not just one day but multiple days with them to determine scientifically how much support they actually need. And then they will be granted a global budget which they will be able to control themselves to, um, uh, to, to, to deal with their disability. Now, the, um, the Saturday paper says that's all complete bullshit. And in fact, what they're going to do is robo-planning. So basically, um, uh, provide, using a formula based on one's primary disability, and I'm sure that um, uh, certainly, certainly me, I don't know about the other members of this panel or indeed others here, but um, primary disability only begins to scratch the surface of how uh, one's impediment uh, uh, makes one disabled in the society, um, you know, that um, uh, it will woefully underestimate the amount of support which we need to be able to take back our lives. Now, I've only been, um, I've only been a person with disability for the last, whatever, eight years or more, more or less, but um, uh, I've been only been to one uh, disability specific uh, demonstration. That was in 2019. It was just before the, um, the state election in New South Wales. And it was around uh, the attempt by the New South Wales government to restrict or cut funding from disability support services. And um, that, was a, that was a demonstration in uh, Martin Place. And it had, um, albeit that it was probably only attended by maybe 100 uh, persons with disability, the image, you know, on the mainstream media of, um, you know, all these, these people in, in wheelchairs gathering in the one spot, carrying, um, you know, uh, placards saying, I don't think it's a stand by me or something ridiculous anyway, but, um, <laughs> you know, it won, it won. But then, of course, as soon as it won, bang, there goes the organisation. All of the peak groups who've been absolutely fucking co-opted, uh, not only by NDIS, but I think more broadly by, um, uh, by you know, the, uh, the, the, the state system, uh, even um, in, in the development of NDIS and so on and so forth, disappeared from the scene. And to, to their eternal shame, I haven't heard any of the, uh, the peak groups come out and condemn the, um, the, the, I know there are perhaps some, but I just haven't heard them, but certainly uh, to, to condemn the kind of reforms that uh, the, the, the Albanese government is attempting to bring in at the moment um, on NDIS. Which really leads it to the grassroots, and, and as we all know, and I think, um, you know, and the, the reflections that my other panel members have made in this, um, uh, in, in this discussion, that it is profoundly difficult uh, to organise um, as a person with disability or indeed to organise people with disability. I think we need to try. I think we, I think um, from my perspective, and obviously this is, um, you know, I'm not trying to be objective, but I think um, Green Left is a terrific organising tool and I think it's fundamentally important that we um, include the discussion there and really start to branch out from there as far as possible. But, um, you know, and to use social media and so on and so forth, but the way that NDIS has been set up, it is completely um, privatised and personalised. You know, we all get our individual budgets and it's like, um, you know, uh, individual contracts. Nobody knows how much anybody else has got and there's no unan unanimity. Uh, two people with exactly the same diagnosis may receive radically different um, uh, funding in, in, in their NDIS plans or in individuals and certainly echoing Janet's point that um, from time to time NDIS just decides to slash your budget by 50% um, and then you know you take them to the AAT and then they increase it by 50% you know there is no logic there is no there is no sense to this at all um, there is there is there is no um, so it does make it, I think, very difficult. That being said, I think we need to try, and I think, um, and I really do, just harping back to what I said um, earlier, I think today is an excellent start in that process.
Any any last reflections? No. Um, yeah, so I think on the point of accessibility, I think it's about opening up ways for people to participate in general. Um, having this one size fits all of like you have to do this to be a member of this organisation um, is restricting. It's like certain people, I mean, and again, this is one of these things that applies to everyone. Maybe you have someone who's out there. I know Nova's used the example or Zoe has used the example many times of a member of the Socialist Alliance Committee who is out there constantly talking to unions and doing union work. So that they're un that, but they're, they're unable to attend the meetings as a result. And so I think rather than having this one size fits all kind of criteria for membership, actually saying, well, yeah, there are other ways to engage. You know, if you're giving back, um, then you can be a member and you can have a say, um, whether that be, you know, doing media stuff. Uh, like I'm a filmmaker, like I trained in, yeah, editing and stuff. So like that's something that I can do. I don't even have to leave the house or I can do graphic design, or I can do social media. Um, so it doesn't always have to be you go out on the streets for a protest or you show up to every single meeting and you go through that process. There's, it's about opening up the kind of, I guess, making membership in these organisations more accessible. Thanks. Thanks to the panel, Graham, Brenton and Riley. Another big hand. Thank you.